When the world was ravaged by a pandemic in 1918, New Brunswick was turned to as an example of how to best deal with the catastrophe. As the result of strong proactive measures used to stop the spread of the outbreak, the province suffered one of the lowest rates in all of Canada during the Spanish flu epidemic over a hundred years ago. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. As the First World War was finally drawing to an end, a deadly influenza began to sweep around the world. The disease disproportionately affected the young and the healthy with astonishing speed. A young person in the prime of their life and in perfect health could begin the day feeling perfectly normal and by noon be so sick that they could be bedridden. Within hours they could be struggling to breathe and frothing blood from their nose and mouth. All too frequently only 48 hours after they first showed symptoms, they would be dead. When the news of this disease began appearing in far-flung parts of the world, little attention was paid to it in New Brunswick. On October 3rd, 1918, the St. John Standard newspaper printed a lengthy editorial dismissing the news of the outbreak. The newspaper said, the epidemic will probably pass away as suddenly as it came. And then it offered some helpful cures, such as walk about in the sunshine. If you are in a stuffy car, have the windows open. Gargle your throat twice a day. And above all, do not go around lamenting the danger of the influenza as a topic of conversation. The crazy part about this was that that specific editorial was literally surrounded by other articles which were illustrating the severity of the disease, which was also literally surrounding New Brunswick. There was a news article about a military base in Quebec that was under quarantine. There was an article about towns in Vermont where thousands of cases were breaking out. And there was an article about several doctors and nurses from Halifax answering Boston's plea for medical assistance. Only days after that editorial was published, the pandemic swept into New Brunswick with staggering speed and alarming ferocity. Life in Fredericton ground to a halt when the capital city, whose population was only 7,500 people, had 1,000 cases. Right at that moment, New Brunswick's Department of Health was formed, the first such body in the entire British Empire's long history. It actually wasn't rushed together as a last-minute effort in the face of the outbreak. On the contrary, it had been fought over and debated for months beforehand. It was actually by sheer incredible luck that all of that hard work had paid off at precisely the exact moment when it was needed the most. Prior to the creation of the Department of Health, a matter of days before the pandemic hit, Outbreaks of deadly disease were simply considered an unfortunate part of life. In times of disease, local councils would appear, they'd be created at the last minute to fight the outbreak, and then they would disband when that specific threat had passed. Little was done in terms of any proactive measures to stop these outbreaks before they started, and there was actually a lot that could be done. For example, let's look at the issue of back alley slaughterhouses. Back alley slaughterhouses. These are exactly what they sound like. People keeping pigs in alleys and butcher shops also in the alleys would slaughter them and they would drain them and this would all be taking place right in the city's alleyways right between apartment buildings where people lived. This curious phenomenon makes a lot more sense if you think about it in the context though. These were Obviously, in the poorer parts of town, wages were low, food was expensive. Growing livestock, though, was cheap, especially pigs, because pigs eat everything. But in the cities, where else are you going to keep your pigs? 
that you rely on as a key source of food for your family. Oh, the back alley. Trying to tackle this back alley slaughterhouse issue and the diseases that came with it. Just think for a minute about all of the flies that would be around back alley slaughterhouses. This was the specific cause that first motivated one quiet doctor who would go on to lead New Brunswick through the 1918 pandemic. The brand new Department of Health was the brainchild of two crusading St. John physicians, Dr. George Melvin and Dr. William Roberts. Dr. Melvin was the public health officer for the St. John district, and he loudly railed against the inadequacies of his position, both its lack of funding and its lack of powers. The two doctors were specifically agitated by medical professionals not having the powers to close St. John's open-air back alley slaughterhouses. Dr. Roberts decided to run for office to be representing St. John in the legislature under the Liberal Party's banner. He had some assurances before he ran that if elected he would be free, or as he phrased it, fairly free in creating a Department of Health if the Liberal Party won. He campaigned on health, claiming that there was a need for a strong, centralized government agency to protect the health of New Brunswickers. During his election campaign, he pointed out that St. John's dilapidated hospital only had 125 beds for a city of 45,000 people. That was actually a lot better than Moncton's hospital. It only had 50 beds. Fredericton had a whole other issue. Its sewage system emptied into the river. Upstream from the city. St. John, not to be outdone, counted some 300 toilets, which emptied directly into their drinking water. At least two years before the Spanish flu epidemic hit New Brunswick, Dr. Roberts was explicitly warning that the province was at risk of a pandemic outbreak. Dr. Roberts narrowly won his seat in St. John that election, and the Liberal Party, under whose banner he ran, also narrowly won that election, setting the stage for his goal of replacing the county health board system with a Department of Health. Dr. Roberts had opinions on the county health boards, he had, shall we say, rather strong opinions on them. The county health boards were broken, spasmodic, diversified, ignorant of true principles, narrow, and generally only put into practice when some calamity like an epidemic reared its ugly head and began its destructive course. That rather aggressive description might give you the impression that Dr. Roberts was some kind of a firebrand. He was actually very soft-spoken both figuratively and literally. His speeches were famously difficult to actually hear by those who were attending his speeches. The county health boards were what Dr. Roberts called a branch of a sub-branch of the provincial government. The board's head, who got paid $500 a year for his services, had no clerk, no secretary, no staff of any kind and he met and dined with his provincial board one evening out of each year, and so settled the public health destinies of the province for the next 12 months. He also wanted the new health system to be led by medical professionals first and foremost, as opposed to the system he was seeking to replace, which consisted of nine very respectable gentlemen, of whom one or two were medical men, one or two were plumbers, and the others lawyers, grocers, lumbermen, and I think a farmer or two. The county health boards also weren't cheap, perhaps as a proactive attack on what he was keenly aware would become a criticism of his new Department of Health, Dr. Roberts frequently pointed out that the province of New Brunswick went into debt for the first time to pay for these county health boards when the province had to issue bonds for $125,000 to cover their expenses. A price I considered extravagant in its cost compared to the good accomplished. 
$125,000 is a lot of money to put up red, yellow, and green quarantine signs on houses. The freshly elected Dr. Roberts was now able to bring his health care bill to the legislature. But actually passing it was a whole other ordeal. The Liberal Party had nearly been wiped out in the previous election and effectively had to be rebuilt from scratch, meaning it was distinctly lacking in experienced MLAs by the time Dr. Roberts was elected and it formed government. Three shadowy backroom political operatives nicknamed the Dark Lantern Brigade had rebuilt the party, but they tightly controlled things behind the scenes. The Premier himself, William Foster, was nicknamed the Boy Premier because he looked youthful. He was actually 50 years old. But he was also extremely inexperienced. He'd basically been made leader because he was good looking and likable, but he was extremely out of his depth. Also, the Liberals had only won a precarious minority government and they were just hanging on by a thread. Soon after getting elected, Dr. Roberts brought his bill to create a Department of Health to his Liberal colleagues. He was confident that his bill was going to be a priority, because that was what he was promised. It turns out, this wasn't the case. The Dark Lantern Brigade told him that his bill was not going to be introduced. Tenaciously, he returned to the caucus a second time. And again, he was turned down. The story goes that he angrily got into a heated argument with his fellow liberals, and then he threatened to resign, and he stormed out of the room. The fellow liberals were shocked at this threat to resign, because there was a realistic chance it would bring down the whole government and cause a new election, because the liberals barely had enough seats to govern. While the fellow liberals decided what to do, Dr. Roberts had actually stormed off to his office and was working the phone. He returned to the meeting, armed with a long list of prominent people in the other Liberal MLA's own writings, including leading industrialists, businessmen, and prominent clergymen who supported my bill. Suddenly, the Liberal caucus agreed that his bill would be presented to the legislature. This actually just led to a whole new series of debates. There was not a Department of Health anywhere in the entire British Empire at that time. Frankly, many New Brunswickers hadn't even heard of such a thing, let alone thought that they were somehow missing out by not having one. Even worse, the new Department of Health he proposed was far more wide-ranging than many had expected. He was pushing for it to regulate everything from restaurants to factories from butcher shops to boarding houses to drinking water to advertising for medicines, none of which were actually regulated by the government at that time and could kind of do whatever they wanted. The opposition balked at the scope and the cost of this. Too much government interference for too much money, shouted one conservative MLA from St. John. The conservatives thought that the cost would be outrageous and the new bureaucracy would be nauseatingly large. The new department would be hiring a massive staff of, get this, seven bureaucrats to run it. Worried that his bill would fail, and in an effort to reduce the costs, Dr. Roberts offered to work for free. He would forgo his own salary if only this Department of Health was created. That made an impact with the opposition, and the bill narrowly passed. This was in April. 1918, and overseas stories of deadly outbreaks of disease were already circulating. The formality, called Royal Ascent, meant that Dr. Robert's bill only became law at the beginning of October. This meant that in a remarkable coincidence, the Department of Health was created as reports of outbreaks were pouring in from every neighboring state and province surrounding New Brunswick. Despite the news reports of the disease being published, and it being clear that this disease was getting ever closer, it seemed that the media, the government, and the public basically took it for granted that somehow this disease was going to skip over New Brunswick specifically. But guess what? 
it didn't. Within one month of its proclamation and with no staff as yet, except my chief medical officer and myself, the epidemic of influenza struck the province, and for nearly four months, a literal hand-to-hand -hand combat with death ensued, with makeshift staff emergency hospitals, volunteer assistants, army surgeons, and any and all help that offered and could be employed with even a prospect of usefulness. When the Spanish flu struck, it struck hard. Within a week of its arrival in the province, communications were largely cut off because telephone operators were ill. Trains had stopped running because the conductors were sick. Minto's mining camps were struck so badly there was nobody left healthy enough to cook. Hospitals were long since filled and hotels took in people who were lying ill in the streets. The army built makeshift hospitals in public parks. The new Department of Health had only hired one person so far, aside from Dr. Roberts. His old friend from St. John, Dr. Melvin. Basing their response on the then-recent Halifax explosion disaster, which had occurred only one year before, the two doctors from St. John acted quickly to try and contain the pandemic raging across the province. Schools, theaters, and churches were all shut down until further notice. All doctors and nurses in the province were registered, and they were ordered to go into the worst hit areas. This type of mobilization was necessary because in the beginning, even a relatively major city like Grand Falls didn't have one single doctor or nurse. The military was heavily relied on to provide aid, Massive tent hospitals were built in public parks in the cities all across the province. Civic groups were also mobilized from women's institutes, church groups, nursing students, and even Boy Scouts. The recently recovered were pressed into service to help those who were still sick. Fredericton High School's Home Economics Department cooked for the bedridden. Dr. Roberts and Dr. Melvin ordered quarantine and stay-at-home orders, but enforcement was an issue. In rural locations, such as mining or logging camps, the sick would try to make it home where they could receive care, but they would infect everyone they met along the way. Reports of sick people taking the train home from camps, but being dead by the time they arrived, were distressingly common. By the middle of November, as the war in Europe finally came to an end, the pandemic in New Brunswick began to be contained, with the rates of infection beginning to decline. Although there had been over 35,000 cases and 1,400 deaths in a province of only 350,000 people, New Brunswick suffered the second lowest death rate in all of Canada. Much of the credit went to the new Department of Health, with the St. John Telegraph writing in an editorial. The disease has proven the absolute necessity of health regulations such as Honorable Dr. Roberts succeeded in engineering through the legislature last session. This was only the beginning for Dr. Roberts, though. Soon after, the Department of Health broadened its scope, launching a massive new program to vaccinate the province's schoolchildren. By the end of 1920, 50,000 of New Brunswick's 60,000 school-aged children were vaccinated against smallpox, mumps, and measles. He also established a program putting nurses in schools, health inspections of children, and even a free school lunch program. A new health program for pregnant women was put into place and the province's abysmal infant death statistics began to plummet immediately. The infant mortality rate in New Brunswick now is 4.2 per 100,000. Before the creation of the Department of Health, it was a shocking 135 per 100,000. Only one year after the program started, it fell to 103 per 100,000, so these results were almost immediate. For adults, 
He established a network of free clinics to deal with sexually transmitted diseases, which were actually a significantly larger issue than one might expect. The Department of Health kept having to deal with unexpected new issues at every turn. For example, there was no centralized collection of registration of births, marriages, and deaths at the time. Before this, it would be surmised that New Brunswick was a place where few new infants ever came and where once they were born, no one ever seemed to die. Sorting out who was alive and who was dead in New Brunswick took two years much longer than the vaccination programs. In the end, it turns out that New Brunswick had more births per person than anywhere in English-speaking Canada. The successes of the Department of Health were noticed far and wide. It was studied and replicated in England, all over major American cities like Boston and Philadelphia, and all over Canada. Dr. Roberts' ambitions did not stop there, however. He aimed to defeat all diseases. Pneumonia and cancer in New Brunswick still hold the field against us. We look forward with confidence that the arch enemies of the human race are not invincible. We shall finally find a chink in their armor, an Achilles heel in their makeup, by which they may be brought to bay and may decease the bringing of the young adult and the middle aged to earth far in advance of their allotted three score years and ten. Three score years and ten is, of course, seventy years. New Brunswick's life expectancy now is 80 years and 8 months. However, Dr. Roberts' own career was cut short prematurely when he lost his seat in the next election, because voters were mad that he had ordered milk to be pasteurized. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.